Hi, everybody. This is Town Peterson, and we're in week 30 of the ENM course. So, yeah, we're beyond a half year that we've been doing this course. We're in the final lap, so we've just got some lectures on model repeatability, reproducibility, uh, and then some special topics, which I think you should be fi finding pretty fun. Uh, and then we will go into kind of a wrap up phase. But for the moment, we are going to talk about reproducibility of niche modeling results. So I'm going to give you a quick um, overview of what's going on in this area. And then we'll have um, some talks to accompany this, this overview uh, that'll give you quite a bit more detail. So let's jump into things, OK? Okay, so as I said, what I want to do is give you a bit of an introduction to the situation regarding model reproducibility or reproducibility of results in general uh, using ecological niche modeling tools uh, or in, in distributional ecology as a, an area of inquiry more generally. Um, I'm going to give you some initial examples, and I'll emphasize at the outset, I'm not setting out to demean anybody. I've anonymized them as much as I can, um, but I just want to show you that in the literature right now, we have some pretty serious problems with reproducibility. Um, and then I'll go on and show you the three papers that have come out in the last year or so that speak to this question. Um, which we'll hear a lot more about in subsequent lectures. Uh, and then just, I'm going to go over kind of a, a sequence of levels of reproducibility that, that, um, that perhaps can serve as a bit of a guide to what's going on uh, and what, what are important steps and what are more important steps. So let's jump into this. Um, so First point is, you guys are familiar with the Surgeon General's warning that smoking can be damaging to your health. Well, um, to illustrate this, this talk, um, I just did a search in Google Scholar based on the term ecological niche model. And uh, I was looking for empirical data-based papers that were published in 2020. Um, this is a kind of a dodgy thing to do because um, I feel bad using other people's papers to illustrate methodological problems. Um, if any of you happens to recognize your own paper, I'm not attacking you. I'm attacking myself as well. I've, I've committed some of the same errors. Um, so indeed, one of these papers is a paper that I'm a co-author on. And reading it over again, I see that I could and should have done a better job with description of the methodology. So again, please, nobody be offended. Uh, and just bear with me. I'm just trying to make a more general point. So here we go. So here's a, a paragraph out of a method section. Um, model training phase estimates the average AUC of the rock curve. Uh, AUC values closer to one or better. Um, well, so I read this paragraph and I've checked the neighboring paragraphs to make sure that I'm not being unfair to the paper. Um, but what platform was used for doing these calculations? Maybe it was done in the built-in um, rock AUC uh, calculations that are provided within Maxent. Um, but part of rock calculations is, is um, please specify whether evaluation data were set aside. Uh, because if you don't set, do that step, then, then Maxent uh, just uses the calibration data, uh, which is not appropriate. It's circular. And so if evaluation data were set aside for this step within Maxent, what proportion of the data was set aside? Another example. Again, these are just the, the first 10 papers 
that I found as I as I um, walked through the Google Scholar search. Um, ground points of documented nesting sites were attained from the published and owned data. Um, climatic data were grabbed, um, et cetera, et cetera. Well, uh, where are the occurrence data? Do I get, have access to them? Um, as regards to the, the topographic data that were used, it says um, its derivatives like exposition, slope, curvature, et cetera. What other variables were used? I can't replicate the use of a variable that's not even named. Here's another one. For these 14 species, we retrieved a total of 4,862 occurrence records from multiple herbarium databases. All occurrence records were based on georeference geo coordinate data compiled from GBIF. Okay. Um, and supplemented with occurrence data from regional herbaria and herbarium consortia. Well, let's think again. What are these other sources? Can I access the data or could I replicate the data set? Um, here's, a, here's another example. Three sets of bioclimatic variables were selected. Um, Procedure was aimed at building models that were statistically significant, correctly predicting uh, independent subsets of data, and appropriately non-complex, not overly complex. Well, here are those questions. How are the significance tests done with partial rock? How many replicates were used? What was the, the value of E? Don't believe that's specified. Records with erroneous coordinates expressed with different co geographic coordinates than latitude, longitude, decimal degrees, or with a coordinate accuracy of less than one kilometer were excluded. Ah, what other sources, because you say EG, as in ex generis or for example, what other sources of error were considered? How was coordinate uncertainty summarized uh, or calculated so as to be able to decide what is less accurate than one kilometer? Yet another one, the 19 bioclimatic variable values were assi assigned to point weather stations and a spatial interpolation method was applied to generate input surfaces for modeling. That goes on to talk about inverse distance weighting. But in the inverse distance weighting has a bunch of parameter settings, the power value, the search radius, the member, minimum number of points. What platform was used to generate this, this interpolation? Here's another one, environmental niche modeling. Please people call it ecological niche modeling. Um, but was performed with Maxent software with default parameters, uh, used area under the curve statistic to evaluate model accuracy. Well, let's, let's ask, um, which version of Maxent? Because you're citing the Phillips 2006 paper, is that the 2006 version? But which version you use affects what the default parameter values are. And on what platform were the rock analyses done? Is this within Maxent or what? Was there a randomization step? Were these independent data or at least an independent subset of the data? What was the criterion used? Occurrence data of this species and that species were derived from blah, 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 blah. These data sets provide the most complete and detailed historical distributional information of those species to date. Well, what data were gotten from each source? How precisely could I replicate that data? Were the data checked for redundancy between sources, et cetera? Okay, so again, if I spoke ill of a paragraph in your paper, I apologize. 
I considered just picking 10 of my own papers uh, and trashing my own papers. But I figured it was probably a, a good idea to just show that this is across the whole field. So no offense intended, and I apologize in advance if somebody is offended. But what is the situation? Well, the methods between many or most published papers, even this year, are not crystal clear. And that means those papers or those analyses are difficult or impossible to repeat rigorously. Other researchers th therefore can't use those methods, check the results of those papers, or adapt those methods to their own analyses or explorations. And this is a gap in distributional ecology. It very much reflects a broader challenge that is sweeping across all of science, which is that of making science fully replicable. Well, you know, we're not the only ones. This is just a quick scan across the literature. And my point is simply that one science, one area of science after another is very, very worried about publishing results that are not fully replicable. So we've had three recent papers that have spoken to um, spoken to this, this challenge. Um, both or all three have long author lists and they each take a very different um, path to asking these questions of replicability. Uh, Miguel Araujo um, led a group that, that took this approach of, of rating papers as gold, silver, blonde, or deficient. And you can see they kind of show us the average um, amount of, of, or average level of quality by different, different portions of this process. Um, a second paper led by Xiao Feng um, took a different tact where essentially, actually I should say we in this case, um, assembled a, check, a checklist. And the idea was that you could check off the different steps that you had or had not taken as you did your, your modeling. And then a third one led by Damaris Zarel. Um, again, I'm a, a participant, but here essentially is a, a full metadata documentation. Um, perhaps these latter two are are fairly similar, but, but different enough to both be useful. Um, and this, this latter one uh, comes with a shiny uh, application developed in R that allows um, anybody to assemble a, um, essentially a metadata document that accompanies a modeling effort. Okay, so let's kind of sum up. This is just a quick overview, and I'm just trying to set the stage for you getting a, a few talks about model reproducibility. What are some steps we could imagine? Well, the simplest and uh, perhaps easiest step is to open access to the data. And that is provide the raw materials on which your study was built. This is generally easy. Um, you either say, uh, my data came from version whatever of a particular data set that is assured to be open uh, long into the future. Or you say, um, my data are accessible at this site on the internet, and it has to be a site that is uh, guaranteed to remain uh, open. I'll come back to that with a comment at the end. A second important step is to, to provide the source code, uh, which is to say providing R code or, or other programming code where um, somebody could, at least in theory, walk back through uh, the analyses that you've done step by step by, by reading the code. 
Third step, metadata documentation. And this is a structured summary of what was done, um, which is to say this is a, um, a summary of step by step through the whole process of model development. What are the steps that were taken? Now, a slightly different one is in the form of a checklist. Um, and this is, this is slightly more useful than uh, the simple metadata documentation because it provides a metadata summary that would highlight not just what was not done, uh, sorry, not just what was done, but also what was not done or what was done wrong. And so you can check out the talks by Xiao and Sorel um, coming up this week. Um, a next step is that of scientific workflows. Um, and this is essentially the idea of piecing together tools uh, and data flows and information flows so that the analysis gets done kind of in one sweep. Um, you can check out uh, Luis Osorio's niche toolbox, which has an interesting, um, it's somewhere between a workflow and very detailed open source code. Um, but it's a really nice kind of uh, recording of the analyses that you do. And then last but certainly not least, there we can take this workflow idea and make it fully replicable. Um, and here I strongly refer to you, you to a talk um, by Mondelli and Gadelia that will come up in the frontiers section of this course. And essentially, this is the idea of not just the source code and the data and the connections between tools, but this is boxing up the programs in the appropriate versions and all that, but even um, a mirror or a, a, an image of the whole operating system of your computer. Uh, so it's very, very interesting work. I'm gonna give you a, a few more comments. Um, one is when you go to open data and you say, well, it's in the supplementary materials of my paper, which I published with you know, such and such journal, uh, which has a publisher, which is Wiley or Elsevier or, or one of those. Do remember that those supplementary materials are made available by the publisher. And that publisher could go out of business next year and just not provide that material online anymore or they could, sell, um, they could sell their full set of content to a commercial interest, which could say, oh, you want those data? You want those supplementary materials? Uh, just type in your credit card number. So my personal feeling is that open data on a commercial journal website are not permanently open because they may well stop being open at any point. And so I would recommend much more uh, either a university repository or a repository that has the purpose of long-term openness. So it's just a matter of thinking carefully about, uh, about the, the choices you make, because every one of those choices has implications as far as, um, as far as the true reproducibility in the long term, 10 years, 20 years, 50 years from now of what you're doing. Then one other comment is, think about what a bad model we have right now, which is, we have this model right now where we, we use text to describe very complex sets of steps. Um, that's probably a bad model. 
And so I think there's a there's space at least for um, thinking about fully replicable workflows, not replacing methods sections, but obviating them. Imagine if um, some person on the other side of the world uh, publishes a paper and you are interested in the results, but maybe you want to change the analysis slightly. As it is right now, you'd have to work very hard to figure out what it is that that colleague did, replicate those analyses completely, which may not be possible, certainly won't be easy, and then uh, make your changes. Or maybe you really like the analyses that were done and you want to try it out on your own data set. Well, again, what you've got to do is figure out exactly what was done to the point where you can replicate it with that author's own data before you can try it with your data. What if instead you just downloaded this, this executable, executable file and um, double clicked on it or whatever, whatever it takes and it unpacks and has all the code and all the data and all the programs, everything you could possibly need right there. And it should essentially run the analyses exactly as they ran for the author of the paper. Then you could unplug their data and plug in your data, or you could leave their data plugged in and change the processing. That would really revolutionize science. And so I think keep it in mind that in the not too distant future, that sort of thing is going to be doable. And we should welcome it. We should be very, very excited about that because that will make our science truly replicable. Okay, so these are not concepts unique to, to uh, this group or this course. Um, there's a pretty neat movement out there um, centered around the concept of FAIR data, and that is F-A-I-R, making data findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And the idea is that if steps are taken uh, towards each of these goals, findable, accessible, interoperable, reusable, then uh, the study will be as reproducible as possible. So I recommend looking into fair data principles and adhering to them uh, as much as you are able to. Okay, so that's an overview of uh, these ideas. And I hope it's been useful to you, uh, and I hope the, the, uh, the succeeding talks after this will be useful to you as well. Thanks very much. Have a good afternoon.